Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Turn to your neighbor, tell them Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Tov. So glad to have you all this morning for the last portion of the book of Bar, the book of Numbers. Parshat Mas'e, that would normally be read with last week's portion, Matot, in the land of Israel. Uh, this is the last portion on this Shabbat. Uh, those in the exile would have actually waited to hear both of them this week. And the nice thing about it is we will actually all be back on track by next Shabbat and in the first portion of the book of Devarim. Uh, Devarim will be also the portion Devarim. So we'll be back on track during this time. We're still in the three weeks of mourning the loss of the temple. And uh, there is in the midst of sorrow great joy still because we always think ahead of the future coming of Messiah to his temple. Amen? Amen. I said amen. Amen. amen? amen. Praise the Lord. So this week's portion, I ask the question, who's accusing you? Mm. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, or ask them the question, who's accusing you? We hope no one, they're right. <laughs> and we say a hearty bruchim ha'im to everyone. Welcome to everyone here today. Shabbat shalom. And to our friends, family, and guests, we're glad that you're here today. Let's give it up for those that have come to the house of the Lord today. We come with great joy. And this week's portion comes from Bemidbar, Bar, the book of Numbers 33, 1 through 36, 13. Yirmiyahu is our prophet reading, which is the book of Jeremiah 2, 4 through 28 and 3, 4. We also read from 4, 1 and 2 as an extra reading. Uh, sometimes between Ashkenazi and Sephardic communities, there's extra readings. And then the book of Yaakov, which should be James, uh, or actually should be Jacob, but it's translated James, or in Spanish, Santiago. That's a whole story in itself of why James became, uh, or Jacob became James. But nonetheless, the book of James is a great read for us, and so you can read that and be encouraged by it. So we're going to take our tigments of Torah. How many ready for some Torah teaching today? Yes. Let's take a look at the book of Numbers, chapter 33, verse 1, and it says, These are the journeys or in Hebrew, Mas'e of B'nai Israel, the sons of Israel, when they came out of what country? Egypt, by their divisions under the hand of Moses and Aaron. In Hebrew it says, V'yad Moshe V'aharon. The Yad, the hand, the instruction, the leadership of Moses and Aaron. How interesting that Moses and Aaron both had moments of disobedience where they could have been removed from their position, but God solidified who they were. Even with Aaron and the golden calf, there was forgiveness and atonement and redemption. Throughout this message, you're going to see that in the midst of the enemy accusing you, there's also God's grace and mercy that assures you and confirms you to let you know who you are in the Lord. Amen? How many know we don't know who we are? No one else will. Because those who know their God will do exploits. Well, how can you do exploits if you don't know who you are and whose you are? Right. You have to know who, who covers you who blesses you, who uses you, and why he chose you. And when you learn that, no weapon formed against you with well, what? Prosper. Prosper. It doesn't matter if you're between hell and high water, between a rock and a hard place. God is always looking to bless his people. I'm going to say that again. God is always looking to bless his people. There's never a day that God says, you know, I think I'm going to give up on them. Right. You might give up on yourself, but God never gives up on you. Because God is a God of blessing. And that's why he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that blessing on Abraham's life is irrevocable. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it again. That blessing on Abraham's life is irrevocable. Amen. And if that blessing went 42 generations to get to Messiah, 14 to David, 14 more from David to exile, and even in the midst of the exile, which came about because of disobedience, God says 14 more generations. If you read Matthew chapter 1, especially 117, he says there was 42 of those generations to get to Messiah Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Aren't you glad that God still has a blessing of Abraham called Messiah in your life and in my life? Aren't you glad today that you have the blessing of Messiah in your life? Yes. What if he would have never come? What if he would have never walked this earth? What if he never would have taught us the real meaning of Torah? What if he would have never led us and guided us? by the Spirit of God? What if he would have never done the miracles he did and opened blind eyes and raised the dead? What if he would have never raised your life? Mm. Have you ever thought about a day? You know, they had a, a movie called A Day Without a Mexican. Go ahead, laugh. No, it's actually not so funny because you think about it. The Mexican people have added quite a bit of heritage 
to what we call America. Sure. Yes, in fact, if you go back in time, <laughs> yeah. it was more Mexican and Indian before it was ever American. Yeah, right. And so you think about the heritage of the people that are indigenous to the land mm -hmm. that they were raised up in. And I think of the Americas, and I think sometimes we've forgotten the heritage. In fact, it was Spanish Jews that came to America before the Ashkenazi, German and Polish and Russian Jews came to America. 1492 versus 1942, you do the numbers. It's, it's a heritage that the people have in the land. And I think it's the same way with Israel. Israel has been brought to my attention that Israel, the Jewish people are indigenous to the land of Israel. Yeah, I said it. I have a few witnesses in the room. Amen. Amen. And it's in time that we start talking about them belonging within their own land, Amen. that God planted them and raised them up. In, in fact, they've been the ones taking care of the land. Right. You go to Israel, the best communities in Israel, the cleanest communities, are Jewish communities. Right. Not to say anything negative about any other community of people, nationality within the land of Israel, but you want to know who's really taking care of the land, who takes pride in the land? It's the Jewish people. Amen. You won't see graffiti. You won't see trash. Trash is, it, trash is in a trash can. No graffiti on the walls because they take care of what God blessed them with. So I want you to think about the stages of Israel's journey and the stages of your journey. Look at verse 2. Moses recorded the stages of their journeys as at Adonai's command. Adonai. These then are their journeys, their journeys by stages. B'nai Israel set out from Ramses on the 15th day of the first month. The first day after Passover, they left out with a high hand in sight of all of Egypt. Isn't it amazing the day you walked out of your past and into your future, the way you walked away from your sin and into righteousness? You did it boldly in front of the enemy. You ever think about that? You just picked up and left. Go back to the day that you got saved and think about how you just said, you know, I'm done with this stuff. You know what the Hebrew says? Literally pull the stakes up from the ground, move your tent, we're getting out of here. We're going to a better place. How many are sick and tired of being sick and tired and thanking the Lord that God took you to a better place spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically? Everything about your life is better, even when it seems at its worst. Everything about your life is better because... Wouldn't you rather have problems with Messiah yeah. than prosperity without him? Yeah. <laughs> because prosperity without him means it's temporary. But guess what? Problems with Messiah means the problems are temporary. And Messiah is forever. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. This too will pass. Whatever you're going through, you're passing through. Pull up the sticks from the ground and move on. Yeah. Well, I don't like where I'm at. Well, move. In Him we live and move and have our big, it's a walk of faith, it's a journey. And when we realize that we move on, as it says, even at Passover, the stage of deliverance, they left. They pulled up their stakes from the ground, they said, we're leaving Egypt, we're going to a better place. Now, I love the fact that the root for our portion, Mas'e, comes from the root Mas'ab, which means to pull up the stakes, to break camp, to journey in stages. So there are 42 stages of their journey. You're not where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. Amen. Where you're at is where you're at. And if you will see where God is taking you, you can realize it's time to even pull up the stakes today. Pick up that tent. Come on, get off that sick bed. Rise and be healed. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Get up from that place and move beyond that place. But when you've been stuck for a while now, it's time to move. Amen. Tell your neighbor, it's time to move. Amen. We've been at this mountain too long. Come on, it's time to move. Amen. We've been in this dry place too long. It's time to move. There's a land flowing with milk and honey yet awaiting you this year. Amen. No, no, not tomorrow. This year. Come on, declare it. This is my year. This is my year. See, this is my day. This is my day. Come on, the Bible says today, this is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and be glad in it. This is our year flowing with abundance. It's dripping with abundance. Amen. A land flowing with milk and honey. You've got to declare it. This is your year. This is your day. Abraham understood this because he had to move by faith. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Then Adonai said to Abram, Get going out from your land and from your relatives. Lech and from your father's house to the land that I will what? Show you. 
show you. I love the faith that it even takes faith to obey God. Amen. Did you hear that? It takes faith to obey God. Go to a land that I'll show you later. I won't show it to you now. I'll show you later. But I, I'll, I'll show you, but I won't show you until you go. You don't grow till you go. Because if you stay, you're stagnant. But if you go, you'll grow. So even in the midst of journey, you got to have faith. Verse 2, my heart's desire is to make you into a great nation. That nation became Israel. To bless you, to make your name great. He went from Abram to Abraham or Avram to Avraham. So he actually literally increased his name so that you may be a blessing. And when he went from Abram to Abraham, he went from an exalted father to a father of many nations. So God increased him by even increasing his name to having a greater capacity to reach more people. Yeah. Not just one nation, but you're going to be a father of many nations. He says, my desire is to bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And in all, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Literally, the Hebrew says, they'll bless themselves by you or through your example. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, I love what it says here. So Abram kept on what? Journey. journey. He kept what? Journey. Journeying where? South. Southward toward where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. As he kept trying to get to the city whose maker and builder is God, mm. you and I should keep trying to get to that city. Yeah. One day we're all going to be in the new Jerusalem, but we got to keep pressing. It's a highway to heaven. None can walk up there. But the pure in heart. It's a highway to heaven, and I'm walking up the king's highway. Come on, sing it again. It's a highway to heaven, none can walk up there but the pure in heart. It's a highway to heaven. And I'm walking up the King's Highway. Come on, give yourself a hand clap. You have to realize that heaven word is like Jerusalem word. Yerushalayma. You got to realize that you got to go towards Jerusalem. You got to go towards Israel. Yerushalayim is Israel, but as you go towards it, it's like going up to heaven. Because the idea is to get to Jerusalem, you have to go up a mountain. So that must mean we start in the valley, but we eventually make it to the mountaintop. You got to realize where you're at is just a low point in your life, but it's the lowest you'll ever be. It's never going to be this way again. Because you're not settling for what's below, you're settling for what's above. You're not settling for what's in back, you're settling for what's ahead. What is ahead of you is greater than what's in back of you. You can say bye, bye, bye to all those problems because what's ahead of you is God prospering you in a land that he'll call your own. Come on. It's better than a new car. It's better than a new house. It's better than a new job. It's a new destiny for your life. In fact, greater than that, it's a new identity. Oh, come on. Somebody rejoice with me today. You have a new identity in Messiah. You're completely different now. You say, oh, how could she be any different? How could he be any different? We know what they did. We know how they used to be. Your friends and family will always tell you who you used to be. One thing they can never do, tell you who you are. Amen. They can never tell you who you are because they don't know you like God knows you. But God can tell you who you are and who you will become. He did it to Abram. He'll do it for you. Abram, go to yourself. That's what the Hebrew says. Go to who you're really going to be. You're no longer going to be Abram ever again. Notice in the Bible, we never call him Abram again. And unless we're talking about his past. From that point of distinction, he's Abraham. And guess what? We can't go back to who we used to be. We've got to become who God has proclaimed. We're going to be great. You're going to be great. Tell your neighbor, you're going to be great. You're going to do great things. You're going to be a great person. Not that you're not great now, but you're going to get greater. You're going to do greater things. Greater works will you do, Messiah said. Now, look at verse, uh, look at Numbers, back at Numbers 35, 10. I'm going to transition into something that's going to take us into why I named this message, um, who's accusing you. Look at verse 10. Speak to B'nai Israel, saying, when you cross, not if, when. I'm going to say that again. Not if you cross, when you cross. Oh, well, if we make it. Oh, if I get that job. Oh, if, no, no, start saying when you get it. In fact, what if you prepare today for what's coming tomorrow? 
well, when I go on my vacation, and when I get that promotion, and when I get married, and when I have children, and when I get that new, that new blessing in my life, whatever it is you're praying for, what if you start talking about when instead of if? Yeah. And stop looking at everybody else so iffy. Well, I don't know if she's going to make it. Well, I don't know if he's going to be able to do that. Well, I don't know if you don't, but you have a God who does know. Amen. Wouldn't it be better to talk to God like, Lord, I thank you for enabling that person to fulfill this. Lord, I thank you for my children being blessed. I thank you my kids are coming out of darkness and into a marvelous light. What if you started proclaiming what you are going to be, not could be, are going to be? Because God already said his word is settled. What if you declared of your children, my children will be blessed, my family will be blessed, my marriage will be blessed, and don't allow the enemy to put any other accusation or accusative words in your mouth against your spouse, your family, your children, your grandchildren, your, your, your in-laws, everybody. Just throw them all in the bag of blessing. Amen. I know sometimes we want to throw them in a the bag, and you know what my grandfather, my great-grandfather used to do? He used to actually get a, um, uh, a bag and take the cats out. He'd bag up the cats and take them out someplace. He, he, didn't, he couldn't have cats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and that, the cats would be gone. Because they hated the way the cat was, cr cr you know, go around your legs, kind of in and out, and kind of act like they own the place, you know. And then the, the, the hair they leave. Now I know some of you cat lovers out there are like, Rabbi, you can't say this stuff. I'll tell you what Grandpa did, Great Grandpa did. But let me tell you, sometimes we want to throw people away like cats, like alley cats. What if you put them all in one big bag of blessing? Lord, bless them all. Bless my accusers. Bless my abusers. Bless my uh, rejectors. Bless my, my co-workers. Bless everybody. You know what? If you bless them, even if they try to curse you, coals of conviction on their heads when they try to come against you. Because I will bless those who bless you, but I'll also curse those that disregard you. You know, you can't disregard my blessings. Oh, you can't take away my blessing. Enemy, you can't take away my blessing. What if you told the enemy every day, devil, it won't work. Come on, look them square in the eyes. Mm -mm. Yep. Devil, it won't work. Yep. You know why? Because you've already had a, con a conversation with God. Mm -hmm. Submit to God, then resist the devil. Mm -hmm. You know what we try to do? Wake up in the morning, have a conversation with the devil. <laughs> oh, the devil's going to have been after me all week, and I don't know if I'm going to make it. That's devil talk. Because mm -hmm. God doesn't talk that way. God never talks defeat because he's never lost a battle. Amen. Victors never talk like victims because they're victorious and they're victors. And when you talk like a victim, you're talking the devil's language. He's like, I got him. I got him speaking my jive talk. You know the devil's jive talking? He's jive talking some of you. And he'll get you to eventually talk just like him. You ever notice you get around a negative person, eventually you start talking negative? You get around a person that's dreaming big, believing good, big, and praying big, and all of a sudden you just want to emulate what you see in others because, wow, look how that's changed their total life. I want to be like that. I want to have a positive day. I, wanna, I don't want to be sick all the time. I want to eat healthy and get good rest and wake up energized in the morning and be happy at my job and be blessed with my family. I want that kind of life. How many want it? Amen. Why don't you go after it then? Mm -hmm. Come on, take a journey with me. Look what it says. It says, you're going to cross the Jordan into the Canaan land. You are to select cities, watch this, which will be cities of what? Refuge. Refuge. To which one might flee if he has killed someone by accident. Notice the accusation. Well, what if he killed someone? Did he kill that person? I don't know. Did you, did you, did you hear what Joe did? Joe, like, uh, threw a rock up in the air and he hit somebody. He, they're going to get him for manslaughter. That accusation? God says, I want to make a room for that season in your life where you're still trying to work some stuff out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to create a city of refuge to which one might flee if he's killed someone by what? Accident. How many know accidents still happen? Yeah. Sometimes things happen by accident. Stop thinking that everything's a vicious attack against you. Everything is not about you. True. Some things happen by accident. How many times have we not considered that when the person supposedly hurt us, we never thought about what if it was just an accident? They didn't mean to do it. But there's stuff that happens by accident. Look at verse 29. These are the statutes of justice for your generations and all your dwellings. Everyone killing 
anyone shall be put to death as a murderer only on the testimony of more than one witness. No one, say no one. No one is to be put to death on the testimony of only what? One witness. How I many one witness can lie? Right? Look at uh, Deuteronomy 17, 6. It says, by the word of two or three witnesses, the one is to die, the one is to die is to be put to death. No one is to be put to death by the word of what? One witness. Now here we already see two witnesses in the Torah. Right? There's already two witnesses right here. And the hand of the witnesses is to be the first to put him to death, afterward the hand of all the people, so that you'll purge the evil from your midst. Now, let me give you another witness. Deuteronomy 19.15 says the same thing. A single witness shall not rise up against a person for any offense, say offense, yes. or sin that he commits. So whether you got offended by something, someone, something that someone did, or they literally committed a crime or a sin, either one, by the word of two or three witnesses is a case to be established. Suppose a hostile witness rises up against someone, anyone, to accuse him of wrongdoing. Look what it says in verse 18. The judges are to investigate what? Thoroughly. And if indeed the witness is a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother. So the whole concept is to avoid injustice. It's just as an injustice against those that have been accused as the one that claims that they are the victim. Now, look at uh, the Torah, uh, the, how the Torah leads into the prophet reading as we take a, a few minutes for the prophet reading. Let's take a look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Zechariah. It says, He showed me, Yehoshua, that's Joshua, the Kohen Hagadol, same name as Yeshua the Messiah, amen? Yehoshua, the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, standing for the angel of Adonai with the accuser. Who's the accuser? Satan. 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 Hasatan. The word Satan means accuser. It says, Hasatan, standing at his right to accuse him. You know the enemy is always in God's face trying to accuse you? Always. The story of Job. The accuser is constantly there day and night trying to accuse you. Watch this. Standing at his right hand to accuse him. Adonai said to the accuser, May Adonai rebuke you, accuser. Indeed, may Adonai, who has made you to Shalim, Jerusalem his choice. See, you know it doesn't even matter what you've done. It's, it matters that God chose you. Amen. David was uh, an adulterer. And he conspired murder. But... He was the apple of God's eye, and he was chosen by God. So therefore, Psalms 51 is to write down how when God chooses you, Hallelujah. and God appoints you to something, mm -hmm. your gift and calling is without repentance, but you still need to repent. Mm -hmm. Your gift is without repentance, but you have to. Mm -hmm. So when you go to God and say, God, against you and you only have I sinned, from that moment forward, when you deal with that sin, when you walk away from it, Gone, washed away, atoned for, forgiven. And that's the beauty of David's life, that David remained as Aaron remained and Moses remained. Watch this. It says, uh, may I don't I rebuke you, accuser. Indeed, he's, God says he's chosen Jerusalem. Isn't this man a man, a burn, excuse me, isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? So imagine the fire, the stick's going to get consumed and someone reached into the fire went in there and grabbed the burning stick out to get it out of there. Can you imagine if something very valuable to you got thrown into the fire by accident and you said, no, 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 quick, quick, get it! And you, you, you sacrificed your life to go in the fire and snatch out what was, was precious. That's what God did to Jerusalem. They were thrown in the fire and God says, I'm going to snatch them out. Yes. You'll go through the fire and you won't be burned. Go through the water and you won't be drowned. Isaiah 43. This is a powerful principle that when you belong to God, God says, even if you go through the fire, you won't be burned. Even though you go through the water, you won't be drowned because I'm going to snatch you out. How many know that was salvation? Amen. The hand of the Lord snatched you out of that situation. Snatched you out. It was the mercy and the grace of God that snatched you out. It wasn't your good grace. It wasn't your good behavior that kept you in the position or the anointing or the calling or the job that you're in right now, the marriage you're in. It was the grace of God on your marriage, on your business, on your family. It's God's grace. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. 
Look at Joshua chapter 20, verse 1, speaking of these designated cities of refuge. It says, Then Adonai spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to B'nai Israel, saying, Designate your cities of refuge, about which I spoke to you through who? Moses. Moses. So the manslayer who kills any person by mistake, by how? Mistake. Stay, accident, and without premeditation may flee there. They will be your refuge. In other words, they, they will be a place, what we will call the secret place of the Most High. A place where you can get along with God and say, God, I don't know what's going on right now with the enemy, but I just need to get into the secret place. I need to get into your, uh, to, to that place of refuge from the avenger of blood. The avenger of blood was the near relative that could, in some case, be a kinsman redeemer. But when there's murder, it's called the avenger of blood. He's going to go for blood. He's going to say, you killed my cousin, I'm going to kill you. That's exactly what's going to happen. And the law would actually allow it unless there was a city of refuge to stop it. Amen. You know, if the enemy could have killed you, he would have by now. Yeah. But he couldn't. Why? Because the hand of the Lord was on your life. Aren't you glad that the hand of the Lord is still on your life? The grace of God is still on your life? There's still a secret place of the Most High, a shadow of the Almighty to dwell in? Look what it says in uh, verse number 4. It says, when one flees to one of those cities, he must stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and, and state his case in the hearing of the elders of the city. The elders are the judges. Remember, the judges weigh everything out. It says, you're going to state your case. Notice it's a legal case. Then they are to take him into the city and give him a place to live among them. And if the blood avenger pursues him, then... They will not hand the manslayer over to him since he killed his neighbor without premeditation and did not hate him beforehand. In other words, it's not like Cain killing Abel. You didn't hate your brother in your heart so that you killed your brother. It wasn't premeditated murder. It was an accident. It was something that happened. Now, look at verse 6. So he will stay in that city until he can stand trial before the congregation until the death of the Kohen Haggadol. Here is the high priest in those days. Then the manslayer may return to his own city and his own house to the city from which he had fled. Now, city of refuge in Hebrew, if you did your uh, morning manna, how many did you read their morning manna? Either online or you saw it somewhere on social media. A few of you did. Let me see the hands that have been reading morning manna. That's all? <laughs> Email, website, website, it's all there. It might be there day by day, but it's there. Man is there when you get there in the morning. It's there. Okay, so now what I need for you guys to do is really be journeying with us because we're trying as a congregation to go somewhere. Notice my message is being just really controlled by what we're doing as a morning manna. I'm showing you the showbread, but it's based on morning manna. Watch this. It says, Are hamiklat. Are comes from the, city, uh, from the word for city ear, and miklat is a refuge or an asylum. Think about this kind of a political asylum concept. It's a place of refuge to run in a court case. Now, I love what David said uh, in Psalm 7, verse 1, a passionate song of David, which he sang to Adonai concerning Cush, a Benjamite. Adonai, my God, in you I will take what? Refuge. Save me from each of my what? Persecutors. I like to say prosecutors. <laughs> and deliver me. Otherwise, he will rip me apart like a lion with no one to rescue me. That's what the city of refuge was about. The avenger of blood might rip me to shreds without even hearing my case. So if I go to the man of God, if I go to the house of God, if I go to the city of refuge where the priest will hear my case, they can weigh out what was right. They'll line me up with the Torah. They'll get my heart right, my mind up right. They'll see... What if we start dealing with things within the house of God instead of going to the world? Yes. That's the way it was supposed to be when you dealt with your offense in the house of God. You don't, you don't make it a legal matter. You, bring, you deal with it in-house so that the person's life could be saved, for there to be restitution. The purpose is to regain your brother. Look at verse 7. Adonai, my God, if I have done this, if there is guilt on my hands, if I have paid back evil to anyone at peace with me, or unjustly attack my adversary, then let the enemy chase me, overtake me, trample me into the ground, leaving my honor in the dirt, Selah. David was saying, God, you're my refuge. If you're not my refuge, this is what's going to happen to me. But that's not going to happen to me because you're my refuge. 
You don't have to fear the enemy chasing you. You don't have to fear what the enemy can do to you. You don't have to fear what, the, what your past will bring upon you. Why? Because you continue to keep God as your refuge. In that place, let the Kohanim, let the priest minister to your spirit, your mind, your emotions, your body, your will, your, your decision making, your life. And let me tell you, they're going to work it out. And then they'll bring you on trial because they're going to weigh out to see if it was premeditated. Because if it wasn't premeditated, like David, you can be restored. Are you following me today? Yes. This is a powerful principle. Let, let me close this out. In Psalm 18, verse number 1, it says, For the music director, this means we're going to sing this, a psalm of who? David, the servant of Adonai. It says, He chanted the words of this song, he was the chazan, to Adonai on the day Adonai what? Delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of who? Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. The guy that I helped is trying to kill me. I was playing music for this guy to take away the tormenting spirit he had, and now you want to kill me? I mean, that's pretty crazy, but you know what happens today? Where people you've helped out, they turn on you and want to kill you. They forget what it was like to be tormented and to have that sweet counsel, and that sweet, sweet ministry, and that sweet worship, that sweet prayer turn things around. But don't ever forget where God brought you from. Saul, don't ever forget who David is in your life. He's the one that took the torment off of your life. And so now you don't turn around and want to kill him. But I love the way David used that refuge, that worship of God to be his refuge. Look at verse 2. He said, I love you, Adonai, you are my strength. Verse 3, verse 3. Adonai is my what? My rock, my what else? My fortress, my what else? My deliverer, my God is my rock. In him I take refuge, my shield, my horn of salvation, my stronghold. I have called upon Adonai, worthy of praise, and I was what? Rescued from my enemies. Look at verse 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of Adonai is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. All right, you ready for the clinching now as we go into the breed shop? You ready? Yeah, I have a couple passages for you. Matthew chapter 16. Come on, you knew I was going to go there. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 16. The words of Yeshua quoting the Torah. And this is how he prefaces this drosh of teaching from the Torah. In Matthew 16, 15, it says, Now if your brother sins against you, what does he do? He sins against you. It says, Go and show him his fault while you're with him alone. Why is it we don't do this more? It's the silliest thing to not do it because it creates greater drama and trauma. If you were to just go to your friend alone to say, hey brother, hey sister, something you, that happened the other day, I just want to get some clarification. I'm not sure if you did it intentionally, if you did it maliciously, but I just want to make sure we're okay. Are we okay? Can we, can we walk as brothers and sisters in the Lord because What's the whole purpose of being the family of God if we're having a family feud every day and every week? How are we ever going to see Messiah come back if we can't even get it together? We want the world to get it together. We in the house of God needed to get it together. Amen? Amen. It says, show him his fault while you're with him. If he listens to you, you have won your what? Your brother. Notice the whole purpose is to restore the brotherhood. It's the whole purpose. Verse 16 says, it. now if that doesn't happen, but if he doesn't listen... Take with you one or two more. Why? You need witnesses. So that by the mouth of what? Two or three witnesses, every word may stand. Okay? Verse 18. Amen. I tell you, whatever you forbid or bind on earth will be forbidden or bound in heaven. And whatever you permit or is bound on earth or is uh, uh, loosed on earth will be permitted or some versions say loosed in heaven. What, in other words, it's like it, it's the court language. It's saying basically, whatever agreement we come to, that's a binding agreement. This is not talking about binding demons or loosing the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not bound that you need to loose him. Second of all, if the devil is bound today, why isn't he bound tomorrow? Does he keep getting loose? Because I need to remind the enemy, you've been rendered powerless 2,000 years ago when Yeshua stripped you from all power and authority and that's how you speak. You don't bind the devil. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say to bind the devil. It says that Yeshua bound the strong man. 
finished work on the cross, you remind him he has no power. So please, let's change our language in prayer. Don't say, I bind you, Satan. Show me in the Bible where it says to do that. It says that he bound the strong man so that he had to give up his goods, your family, your finances, your faith. He had to release it. He couldn't hold you any longer. Why? Because of what Yeshua did 2,000 years ago. What you remind the enemy is not, I bind you. You remind him, you're rendered powerless. Say, you have no authority. Why? All power and authority has been given to Yeshua. And he told me to go in his name and do this, 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 and the other. Guess what? You've been given the authority, the power, not to bind him, but to remind him he's powerless. That's Bible. Because this passage has nothing to do with binding the devil. It's talking about making a binding agreement in a judicial proceeding within the Sanhedrin or the house of God. That's what it's talking about. Now watch, watch what it says. It says in verse 19, Again, I say if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. Meaning when heaven lines up with earth and earth lines up with heaven, it shall be done. Until we line up with what thus saith the word of God, what God says in his word, we're not going to get that prayer answered. It's not in the word. And in fact, if you can't find two or three witnesses in the word of God where God says he's going to do that for you, then it's probably something you're making the Bible say instead of something God said he would do. Right. Got to make sure that what we're praying is the word of God. And he says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, still based on the th two to three witnesses, there I am in the midst. In other words, I'm going to come in the middle of that court proceeding. And I'm going to make my ruling. This is all judicial language. This is referring to the court that Israel had called the Sanhedrin. And he's saying, my disciples are the new Sanhedrin. They're going to make decisions for the body of Messiah. You're going to come to the leadership, because if the brother didn't hear you, then you're going to go back and make sure that there is an agreement. Now, this is what you need to also understand from a previous talk of Yeshua on the Mount of Olives. In Matthew 5.25, this seems weird. But it says in Matthew 5, 25, agree with your adversary quickly. What? That always used to bug me. While you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Now remember, Hasatan is the adversary and he's trying to judge you. So the enemy has been telling you what you did. And you've been trying to tell him you didn't do it. Just admit it and quit it. And just say, you know what? Okay, I, this was my fault in this. I did this. Because here's the thing. The enemy can only tell you your past, but he can never tell you your future. So if he's just going to tell you what you did in the past, he hasn't told you what you've done since. Right. Because maybe there's been restitution already. Maybe you've, you've come to a grip with that. Maybe you've dealt with that. Maybe that's something that's already gone. Why keep bringing up old stuff? If it's under the blood, it's under the blood. That's the, the key that you have to remember with the enemy. The enemy's going to throw things at you. And you just got to say, you know, you're right. I did do that. Yeah, you're right. I used to be a sinner. Yeah, yeah, but now I'm, I'm, I'm a believer now. Guess what? He walks away because he has no more ammunition because he can't go back and forth with you anymore because you just told him, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, wait, maybe I was a thief. Maybe I was a drunk. Maybe it was... And such were some of you, right? Now, I'm not saying personally. I'm just saying in general, whatever the enemy is trying to accuse you of, what if you could just agree with him quickly? Like, okay, let's hurry up and agree on that note. But you haven't mentioned that when I gave my life to Messiah, that my life has been atoned for, that my sins have been forgiven, right? You haven't said anything about that. So look what Revelation chapter 12 says, verse 7. A war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels, and it says, making war against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they were not strong enough. Wait a minute. Let me read that again. The dragon and his angels fought, but they were not strong enough. Amen. Oh, the devil, he's been after me all week. No, he's not strong enough. Well, you don't understand. The enemy has power over me. He's been tending me late, lately. No, no. He's not strong enough. No, you don't understand that principality, that power, that generational curse in my life of my great-great-grandfather that used to do such and such and, 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 and it still has a hold of my life. No, he's not strong enough. Right. The enemy cannot win. He's not strong enough. Say that with me. He's not strong enough. Say it one more time. He's not strong enough. If he didn't win then, he's not going to win now. The battle is already over. Right. Yeshua has won. Yeah. Well, look what it says. 
The war broke out, Michael's angels making war against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer, say no longer, no longer. any place for them in heaven. Why do you keep giving the enemy place? The Bible says don't give place to the devil. He has no place there. Why are you giving him place here? Oh, but you don't understand. I'm right. And I'm going to argue until that person recognizes I'm right. He's not strong enough. <laughs> what are you fighting for? Yep. The battle's already won. Yep. Throw up the flag of victory and say, we won. Yep. And if you've got to forgive, forgive. You've got to move on, move on, because we're getting out of this desert. We're going to the promised land. <laughs> Look at verse number nine. Look what it says. And the great dragon was thrown where? Down. 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 The ancient serpent called who? The devil and Satan. Remember who accuses you before God day and night? Satan. Ha Satan, which means the adversary. Satan. Satan means adversary. And it says, who deceives the whole world. So can the enemy tell a lot of truth? No. Every truth he gets, he deceives with, and he manipulates the story, and he's lying to you. Look at verse 11. But they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even in the face of of death. Even death is victory for a believer. Yeah. If I gotta die for what I believe, I'd rather die for what I believe than live in unbelief. Yeah. Do you hear that? I'd rather die for what I believe than to keep living in unbelief. Yeah. I'm not gonna deny Yeshua. Yeah. I'm not gonna try to be an orthodox Hasidic Messianic rabbi. No. And deny Yeshua. Right. I know too many believers in Messiah that have gotten so enamored with and are gleaning from the wonderful fields of wisdom of the sages, of the Hasidic movement, and the Pharisees, and the rabbis. And this is wonderful that they're gleaning from those fields of rich wisdom. But if your wisdom becomes foolishness to deny Messiah, then I'm sorry, what is all this about anyway if the Torah doesn't lead us to the Messiah? Right. And if we found him and now we're going to deny him, yeah. I can't be a part of that movement. Right. I can't be a part of a movement that takes me backwards instead of forwards. If I've already found him, why, why am I going to be lost and act like he's not yet arrived? Right. He's coming. He's coming again. Amen. You might not know it yet, but you'll sure find out. Watch this. I close with Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Powerful passage. Look what it says. Now we know that all things, what? Work together for good. Even the accusation? works together for the good. Even the tribulation works together for the good. Even what they said about me works together for the good. Well, what if they didn't get the whole thing right? Still works together for the good. But they don't know I'm really right in that argument because they started it, but I just finished it. I'm sorry. Stop fighting. He's working it all together. You know what you do when you make good cookies? You take flour, you take those eggs, you take that oil, you take the, I hope I'm making this right, you take, you know, you got sugar in there, but you also got salt. Salt doesn't make sense in cookies, but it makes the sugar come out better. Because you need a little bit of salt with your sugar. You know what my wife does? She eats some sweet, then she eats some salty, then salty, then sweet, then sweet, then salty. You know, she's always trying to balance, you know, that taste in her mouth. But you know what? It works all together for the good. Why? Because you continue to love God. You're called according to his purpose. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say in view of these things? If God, say it with me. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us what? All things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? It is Messiah who died and moreover was raised and is now at the right hand of God, meaning he's our advocate, our lawyer, and who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? No one. If you read the passage, it goes on. Death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come. Famine, sword, nakedness, nothing separates us from the love of God. Amen. But that's the very thing that makes us feel unloved sometimes when we're naked, when we're hungry, when we're thirsty, when we're fighting. If we would just throw our hands up and say, you know what, thank you, Lord, that none of these things I'm going through separates me from the love of my Messiah. He died for me. He washed me. And he went back and retroactively loved Moses and King David and Aaron and everybody in the past that looked towards the coming Messiah. He retroactively forgave everyone from Adam forward and even to our future. That's how powerful the love of God is.
Yes. Amen. 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 Four things I want you to walk away with today. Number one, we should journal our spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. Look how far you've come. Journal. Mm -hmm. Number two, we must focus on atonement and not accusations. Mm -hmm. The enemy is always going to be doing this. Mm -hmm. But just we keep reminding him, I've been atoned for. it. I've been forgiven. I've been washed. The accusations are going to come, but keep focusing on the atonement. Amen? Mm -hmm. Number three, we find refuge in the rock of our salvation and rest in him. Amen. Don't be in that rock going, oh, what's going to happen? I don't know. You know, a year from now, a day from now. No, no, no. Stop. You're in the secret place of the Most High. Just rest. Yeah. You're protected. Mm -hmm. God's like, I got your back. I got you covered. Moses, I got you covered. Mm -hmm. Remember in the cleft of the rock? Yeah. I got you covered. He just broke the Ten Commandments. No, I got you covered. I got you protected. Number four, we trust our advocate to defend us from our adversary. We trust our advocate to defend us yeah. from our adversary. Aren't you glad today yes. that there's nobody accusing you? Yes. Whatever they can say against you, it's something old, it's something not something new. All you've got to do is keep walking in that grace, keep walking in that forgiveness, keep walking in that salvation, and stay in the refuge of the rock of your salvation. Would you stand yes. on your feet? Mm. Went a little longer than I wanted to today, but you know what? This is some good stuff. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stretch our hands for the blessing. Number 6, 24 through 26. Aaron would stretch his hands to place the name of God on the people as my hands form the name of Shaddai. I declare this blessing in the Hebrew and in the English today. Ya era ronai panavele chavi huneka. He sat on a high panavele chavi huneka. Shalom. Amen. May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May the Lord Adonai shine his face towards you and be gracious to you with favor. May the Lord Adonai lift up his countenance up upon you and towards you today and establish peace for you, your children, and your children's children in the name of Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the anointed Messiah, Redeemer of the whole world. In his name we pray, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. 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 God bless you today. Yeah.